Welcome to Europe Explained, brought to you by the Council of Europe. This podcast series offers a unique window into what we are doing to create a fairer, more democratic Europe. Through conversations with experts and frontline workers, we bring you closer to the issues that matter, from fighting discrimination to upholding human rights, from defending democracy to building laws, systems and institutions that are just, fair and open to all. Welcome to Europe Explained and today we're looking at a subject that's very close to my own heart, that's women in sport. Now, it might seem strange that the Council of Europe is dealing with sport, but if you think about it, sport is a real microcosm of society. So we really do need to look at human rights in sport and safety and inclusion. Some of the work that the Council of Europe has been doing of recent is all about getting real equality for women in sport. There's been two different projects, All In, which was done with the European Union, and now an All In Plus campaign as well. And, of course, the figures show that women face tremendous difficulties. They face abuse, they face sexism, and we're wanting to do things to change that, first of all, to show the extent of what's happening, and then to find ways that we can rebalance it, good projects that are being carried out that are going to be used by all the countries in the Council of Europe. Today, I'm very excited because we've got two great experts who really can reveal what it really is like to be a woman in sport and what it's like for women in sport. That's Patricia Campos, who comes from Spain originally, and Dr Tom Webb from the UK. I don't think we could get two better guests, really, to walk us through what this is all about. Now, Patricia, I was really impressed to see your biography because you were the first female jet pilot in the Spanish Navy, from what I hear. And you've devoted your life to your great passion, which is football, even to the extent that you worked in Uganda with children and women with AIDS to improve their living conditions with the Goals for Freedom project. You've been a player, a coach, referee, and now you're a commentator as well on Spanish television and radio. So really, you've got a lot that you can help us to understand about this subject. Tom, again, very prolific, researching perhaps something that most people don't think about, you know, the management of football and especially at the moment abuse and the difficulties that referees face. So I'm sure you're going to be able to reveal a few rather scary facts for us today. Um, so we'll come to you, Patricia. I'm really intrigued to know a little bit about your path uh, you've really, for me, must be an icon of Spanish women's football and you've travelled all over the place as well. So can you tell me a little bit about you know, the highlights but also the difficulties you've faced being a sportswoman? Good morning, first of all. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I love soccer because my brothers play soccer, so I play soccer with them. I am from a little town. The name is Onda in Castellón, Spain. They that the friends that didn't allow me to play soccer because I was a girl. So my brothers for them leave my sister play. So when they were even eleven versus eleven, I cannot play. But if somebody was missing, so oh you can play with us. So when they realized that I can play more or less okay, they recruit me. But it was hard for me to play soccer in my town because I was the only one. But I, I love soccer all my life, so I keep going. And I arrived to university, they didn't have a soccer team for women, so my colleagues and me, we, we built one. No was soccer 11, was soccer 7, 7 versus 7, but something related to soccer that uh, is our passion. And after that, uh, I keep playing all my life, nowadays I play. So when I realized that um, soccer was so important for my life, I thought that more girls and women can benefit from, from the sport. So I traveled to Uganda, yeah, I used the, the sport like excuse to know what is happening over there. So after that, we set up Goals for Freedom as a non-profit organization devoted to soccer, and we play with women who suffer violence, uh, refugees, women with HIV. So the sport is the excuse to, to be with them, to help them, to know what is going on over there, and to try to put the focus over there with people from Europe. So we are building in a school. It's difficult for us because we are in a small non-profit organization, but we try every year to do like friendly games, to have money, to do one class, another class, because we don't have a lot of money to do like all the, the building, but little by little we are doing things 
using soccer, women in a sport, uh, to do the, this, this goal. This is amazing, actually. So you, you faced not being able to play at all because there were no women or girls who were around. And you've built it up to the point where now there's so many more, young girls especially, who have been inspired by women's football. It's a whole new era. But what challenges do you think that women and girls these days now face? What's stopping more women and girls getting involved in this at all levels? I think it's stereotypes. Some men, they, they don't watch soccer because they think that we don't play soccer very well. So if one day they sit on the sofa and put the TV and watch soccer, practiced by women, they said, oh, they play really well. So now we are world champions in Spain and people are telling, oh, you play really well, but it's not the same. So some people change the way they think, but some people keep going with the same. Oh, yeah, you play wood, but you cannot win to a men's team. We cannot beat to a men's team because we are physically different. So I cannot play against Tom because Tom is going to hurt me, but I can play good soccer against you. So depending on the situation, it's, it's true that now more people or men women or, or boys, teenagers, they both said, like the, the colleague in the room said, no, from women who play soccer or, or famous girls, but before it was impossible that we have our shares in a store. So little by little, we are changing things, but slowly for me. So we had to do more because if women have the tools to be the best ones, we're going to be the best ones. So we don't have the tools, the resources to improve our, our sports, our soccer, our baseball or basket, we are not going to do it, but it demonstrated that when people support us, where the government put money in, in our facilities, we have good coaches, good nutritionists, everything is good, so we are going to achieve the, the exit. That's a really interesting picture of how difficult it is still actually for women. And I think stereotypes for women is just very difficult to overcome. But I want to turn to Tom now. Your research is very specific and I'd like to know if your research sort of shows and reflects these difficulties that uh, Patricia's been telling us about. In short, yes, it does. Um, it is and has been a very challenging environment for officials more widely, but specifically women officials that we're talking about today. What we've done is looked at abuse, aggression and, and maltreatment of officials. And that's a problem across sports and across countries. We've worked around the world on, on some of those issues with organisations in different sports and countries. And then when we specifically look at women officials, those issues are present. And then there's other barriers that are a challenge. And, and Patricia just talked about some of the views of people in charge, the, well, the people in charge are historically and often still men and that creates a barrier in itself even if they might be more receptive to women officials they might not necessarily understand some of the challenges and that can be a problem the environment for women officials has historically been challenging it is improving definitely and I think in, in wider sport we can see that and Patricia gave the example of, of football in Spain I think in other sports as well we can see that some of those attitudes are changing but it's maybe not as quick as we would like. And a lot of the things we're talking about do take time. It's about cultural change and cultural change doesn't happen overnight. It, it's a gradual process, but it also involve and needs the input from people in charge. It needs time, commitment, finances. All of those things are really important if we really want to drive women's officiating forward and improve and increase the number of women in officiating. Mm -hmm. Now, the Council of Europe has run these projects. There's one running at the moment, the All In Plus campaign. What do you think will be the most effective way of actually changing that and making it a much more even playing field, if I dare say so, for women in football and in sport in general? I think... The information is important. So the All In Plus programme is, is certainly important. Um, one of the initiatives I've been involved with is the WINS project, which was funded by the European Commission through Erasmus Plus. That was looking at specifically at women officials and their recruitment and retention. We need to understand what the barriers are, what the challenges are. And the WINS project has really helped us do that. So we've found um, and we've got some concrete information now around officiating clothing. The fact that women officials, two thirds of which in our survey, which was well over 3000 women officials, didn't have specific kit or clothing that was appropriate for them as a woman in an officiating role. Things like childcare, family life weren't considered enough. These are things that we have to address if we want to improve the number of, of women in officiating. Also things like changing facilities. A lot of the facilities that are provided are, are for men or if a woman official turns up to a match and there's a number of fixtures on at the same venue, the likelihood is most of those officials will be men and then 
she may have to change in in a cupboard or something like that we had examples of that and you know it's not conducive to increasing the number of officials or retaining them women in sport because if they have those negative experiences it can be a real um, deterrent to them staying in the sport. So really practical considerations there. Patricia, just turning again to you, what do you think are the steps we should take to improve this situation from your point of view? Education. Education can change the world. So education from families, institutions and schools or universities. So if we try to be careful the way we talk in the house because it's too complicated that when the schools try to teach your son A and in your house you're teaching B, so the kid is going to be confused. If your kid is listening to talking about women's, women's rights, respect, how to be careful, the things we do, our children, they are going to be better. But from the families, we treat but referees, women in sports, so they are going to listen that. They are going to follow the same path. But it's super important, education from the families, institutions and schools to try to make a better world, an equality world, that everybody can practice a sport and we respect each other, independent you are a man or you are a woman. So education for me is fundamental. Yes, yeah, so starting at a very early age and, and helping everybody to get involved. And for you, Tom, what do you think the next steps are? It sort of follows on from what Patricia was talking about. Specifically for women officials, we need to look at how they're supported when they do get into the, the sport that they want to be involved with. And that could be anything from formal or informal support networks, so things that are organised by the governing body or federation, such as specific training and development, or informal, so like WhatsApp groups are encouraged and training groups and things like that, just to provide that network for women officials. And also things such as mentoring. We found that around two thirds of the officials from our survey didn't have a mentor. And yet of those who didn't have a mentor, over 50% wanted one. So we really need to provide those structures around women officials because if we don't do that, when there's a negative experience or a lack of communication or insufficient support, the easiest thing and, and the easy way out is to stop officiating. Well, that's not what we want. So we need to provide those networks that support around women officials if we really want to increase the number within sport to make sure that they stay in sport once they've done the initial training and, and we've recruited them. And how much hope have we got that we're near there? I think it's moving in the right direction, but I still think we're... Um, We've got a way to go. I think events like today and, and the projects that are running at the Council of Europe and that are being funded through uh, the European Commission, like Erasmus Plus and things like that, are, are a step in the right direction to help us understand some of the barriers and issues. But then what we need to start doing is intervening. Yeah, interventions are really important and we need to bring sports with us on that journey. But it also takes political intervention and will and finances and time as well. It doesn't happen overnight. But we have made some big strides in the last few years and Patricia outlined some of those. But I think she's absolutely right in terms of education. Uh, people need to understand why some of these issues exist. Some people don't necessarily understand why they exist or what they are. And we need to educate people on that. But I think we are moving in the right direction, although I'd like to see it move faster. And I'll give Patricia the last word. What would you like to see in the future? Equality, respect... Care. So we have a problem in Spain. Every day, not every month, we have somebody kill a woman. So we don't respect women enough. I mean, you see a woman, a journalist like you, and they have to see that you are a journalist plus a woman. So sometimes they see her as like a woman, or not like a professional. In some fields like soccer or journalism, we suffer a lot of cyberbullying. So it's education at the end because if these people, they are going to be adults, they are educated properly, they are going to be men, they respect women. So it's very important that I hope the future will be better for, for women, for our children, but we have a long way to... But we're starting the journey now. And thank you very much to both our guests and for the listeners out there. Do something, do something to change this as well. Educate your children, think about how you can get involved in sport yourselves. Thank you and looking forward to joining us all next time. If you enjoyed this discussion and wish to explore more topics, be sure to check out our other episodes of Europe Explained. You can also learn more about the Council of Europe and its initiatives at our website, www.coe.int. And don't forget to follow us on social media for the latest updates and insights. You can find us on X, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram.